What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another Highly Combustible Reaction. We're going to be jumping into the next one on our History Guide journey. The next one on our Netherlands journey. Uh, the Dutch fleet and the raid on the Medway. Coming at us from Mikhail. Much, much love. Always keeping us on that history grind. Uh, let's jump into it. Let's check it out together. Let's see what we got. England and the Dutch Republic fought a series of wars over trade in the latter half of the 17th century. Fought largely on the high seas, the Anglo-Dutch wars are easy to forget amongst all of the religious wars, continental wars, rebellions, the English Civil War, and the general redrawing of the map that occurred in a very dynamic century in European history. But the Anglo-Dutch wars were important. They affected the character of European colonization on five different continents, and they represented some of the most significant and interesting sea battles at the very height of the Age of Sail as two of the world's greatest naval powers tested each other's skill with wood, silk, and iron for control of the world's oceans. And the ripping yarn of one of the most daring naval raids in world history deserves to be remembered. In the 17th century, the Dutch Republic and England were two sea powers with very different philosophies. While the English were forming an empire by colonization, the Dutch were more focused on trade. While the English favored a mercantilist system that depended upon exclusive trade with their colonies and funded by tariffs and fees, the Dutch favored free trade that only served to motivate the British colonies to circumvent the English tariffs. While England had a much larger population, the Republic had a more urban population that allowed them greater revenue. While the two Protestant powers began the 17th century cooperating against the Habsburg Empire, by the latter half of the century, the competition over valuable trade routes by Europe's two greatest merchant navies made war virtually inevitable. The Dutch victory over Spain in the Eighty Years' War, or the Dutch War for Independence, in 1648 had come at the expense of Spain, which had been additionally exhausted by the Thirty Years' War, a destructive war of religion fought on the continent, and was now facing rebellion in Portugal. This offered an opportunity for the Dutch to expand their global trading fleet. By mid-century, the Republic had by far the largest merchant fleet in the world, and the value of Dutch trade exceeded the rest of Europe, combined. Whoa. The Dutch colonies were seen as trading centers, and the Dutch Republic operated by merchant capitalism. We knew that, that they became the they, we knew that they became the leaders of the of the whole damn world there for a while. The Dutch East India Trading Company. This is very cool. This is a very cool way to look at it. He even says something that I never even thought of before. So much was going on on the land as far as wars go. The people often forget about the ones that were fought on the sea. You really don't hear a lot about sea tales and things like that when you're from America. Because what you do, you took a boat and you came over there. Like, that's, there's your sea tale. It's, that we don't really get any of that. Oh, we, say, we sailed around and we did this and we did that because we kind of didn't. But when you start getting into this, like, that's a, that's a type of war. That's a type of battle that I would never want to fight. Not a chance. Like, put me on a fishing boat. Cool, I'll go out and I'll catch the fish. But you're talking about like lining up alongside other people with cannons just pointed down your throat. Like I'm I'm saying you had to be a very hard kind of person for that kind of lifestyle. Like to know that that could happen. To know that it was a good chance that it was going to happen. Like, I don't know, it's nerve wracking to think of the things that they did on the water. But we only hear about the things, really, that people did on the land until we start going into other countries and other cultures like histories, at least for Americans. And the value of Dutch trade exceeded the rest of Europe, combined. The Dutch colonies were seen as trading centers, and the Dutch Republic operated by merchant capitalism that emphasized the transportation of goods, shipping and finance over manufacturing and agriculture. By contrast, the English fleet had declined as loyalties were split during the nine years of the English Civil War, allowing the Dutch fleet to dominate trade. However, following victory over the forces of Charles I in 1651, Oliver Cromwell had revamped the English Navy using the same principles upon which he had built the parliamentary new army. While the Dutch Republic had a much larger trading fleet, Cromwell's England had more warships. Fearing and that's not what I want to be Dutch up against. Trade, which often circumvented English colonial tariffs, Parliament moved to protect its trade by passing a series of navigation acts that required goods from English colonies be transported on English ships, cutting out middlemen like the Dutch. These protectionist measures led to war in 1652. The first Anglo-Dutch war was fought entirely at sea and included eight major naval engagements, culminating in the Battle of Shavenina in July 1653. While nominally an English victory, the battle to break an English blockade actually represented exhaustion by both belligerents. 
Cromwell hoped to press the Dutch into joining in a commonwealth, but in the end the English won few concessions, and the trade conflicts between the two powers remained largely unresolved. Moreover, the Dutch seemed to come out of the situation actually in a better financial situation than England, and immediately started rebuilding a fleet, including heavier ships, to compete with the English fleet. The restoration of the English monarchy of Charles II in 1660 would have seemed like an opportunity for reproachment, as the Dutch House of Orange had supported Charles II and lent him large sums of money. However, the trade conflicts continued, and Charles's brother, James, the Duke of York, who was the Lord High Admiral and who eventually became King James II, supported war, largely because he expected to gain personally, financially, by acquiring Dutch colonies in Africa. Many Royal Navy officers also supported the war, as they expected to win battles, as they had during the First Anglo-Dutch War, and thus earn fame and fortune. Many of the English elite saw an opportunity to benefit from raiding and capturing Dutch shipping. And Charles II was easy to influence towards war, as he saw the prospect of a war as a chance to bolster his own authority. Charles began a series of provocations, attacking Dutch colonies in Africa and seizing the Dutch colony of New Netherland in North America. Charles used the Dutch response to these provocations as a cause to declare war in March of 1665. The English won a major victory in the first large engagement of the war in the June 1665 Battle of Lowestoft. The battle, which consisted of more than a hundred ships on each side, and in which the English fleet was see, commanded personally by the Duke of York, was the- You see these pictures? The entire thing is nothing but clouds of smoke and people shooting cannonballs at each other. Like, cannonballs were not small, people. It's not like just try. it's not like someone trying to shoot you with a 9 millimeter. No, a cannonball is doing all kinds of damage, leaving all kinds of shrapnel head of your way. I'm saying it wasn't a good time for anybody that was in any of these battleships. Especially if you had to like man some stations and get ready to No, hell no. Not only no, but hell no. That takes a way harder person than me. More than a hundred ships on each side, and in which the English fleet was commanded personally by the Duke of York, was the worst defeat of the Dutch Republic's navy in its history. And the Dutch flagship, the Eendracht, exploded when its magazine was hit, killing the Dutch commander, Jakob van Bassenier Obdem. However, as was indicative of that war, the Republic could commit far more money to the conflict. Not only were they able to rapidly recover, but the Dutch had already engaged in an ambitious building program, the largest in the history of the Republic, to match the English fleet's heaviest ships. At the time, a first-rate ship of the line, like the English flagship, the HMS Royal Charles, was over 130 feet long and could carry more than 90 guns of various weights of shot and a crew of 500 or more. And how long did it take to build? A single ship. I'm assuming back then without tools and such, you're talking m m months to years, maybe. Look at how like decorative they were. Look how s just stand out as they were artistically, as well as functioning on the water. Like a lot went into the. I'm nothing but like love when I see a full-on wooden ship it's just like oh because I know like that thing took a lot to build that thing took a lot of people a lot of man hours a lot of time so I can imagine that losing one would be a horrendous thing because now you gotta wait for other ones to be built luckily you got some in the shoot I'm assuming carry more than 90 guns of various weights of shot and a crew of 500 or more when the two navies met again in the 1666 Four Days Battle, the Dutch fleet was much improved and had a numeric advantage. In what has been described as the longest and largest battle of the Age of Sail, the Dutch won an inconclusive victory in a bruising battle, only to lose two months later in another large engagement called the St. James Day Battle. The English then took advantage of the damage to the Dutch fleet to make a daring raid on the Vliet Estuary in the Netherlands doing much damage and burning two warships and 140 merchant ships for virtually no loss. The raid, commanded by Admiral Sir Robert Holmes, was called Holmes's Bonfire. Still, neither fleet had been able to substantially reduce the other. The war seemed to be favoring Charles II, who in 1666 moved to push for peace on terms that would be favorable to England. But the, the victories were actually hollow. The Dutch had actually been more successful at privateering, that is, raiding each other's merchant fleets. And the cost of repairs to the ships damaged in the battles of 1666 had left Charles II impoverished. Moreover, London had been stricken with the Great Plague of London, the last major outbreak of the bubonic plague in Europe and then in September 1666 by the Great Fire of London. 
As London was the largest city in England and a great source of royal revenue, the disasters, combined with the costs of the war and financial mismanagement, put Charles II's England near financial collapse. And I'm going to say, that's a lot of Navy. things going on at one time. Much of the fleet was laid up as Charles could not afford to pay their crews. The peace talks were really an act of desperation on behalf of Charles, and also, partly, a ruse, as he was simultaneously seeking to obtain a loan from France to further prosecute the war. The Republic, instead, decided that the best course was to seek a clear victory that would end the war on terms favorable to the Dutch, and so they planned one of the most daring naval raids in history. The Dutch planned to take a fleet up the Thames estuary in Kent, past a fortress at Sheerness at the mouth of the River Midway, to the Royal Navy Dockyard at Chatham where most of the English fleet had been laid up and would be defenseless. It was a daring idea, so much so that many Dutch guy. officers thought it impossible. Objections to which the Admiral in charge, Michiel de Reuter, responded, Orders are orders. The English thought it impossible as well, and they had hardly prepared for the possibility. The Midwich Shoals were thought to be nearly impossible without pilots who knew them, and the idea of a brazen attack in English home waters was largely unthinkable. The fortifications along the Medway were mostly outdated, undermanned, and in decay. At Chatham, where the great ships of the fleet were laid up nearly defenseless, only three ships were manned and ready to defend the dockyard. Oh. De Reuter brought some 60 ships and nearly 1,500 marines, as well as two experienced English pilots who had defected. The Dutch force took the unprepared fortress of Garrison Point at Sheerness quickly, chasing off the 42-gun frigate HMS Unity and forcing the garrison to withdraw by landing an overwhelming number of marines. With Sheerness fallen, the English began to desperately prepare a defense. A large chain had been stretched across the river at Gillingham, but it was lightly defended, with only a light gun battery, which had been hastily established. Several English ships were sunk in an attempt to block the channel into Chatham, and three English heavy ships, the ships of the line Loyal London, Royal James, and Royal Oak, were sunk in order to prevent their capture, with their half-filled hulls operating as stationary batteries. The That's crazy how many precautions they took that they, they took so many precautions that they thought, ah, it's impossible. Nobody could do it. And then they rode in and did it. Like, the Dutch uh. had not even arrived, and the English had already sunk 14 of their own Ooh. ships. When De Ruyter's fleet arrived, their first attack captured HMS Unity by assault as she tried to protect the chain. Unity you imagine being in such desperation to not let them get your ships that you had to sink 14 before they even got there. Like <laughs> Was taken back as a prize. A light draft Dutch fire ship managed to either ram or break the chain or ride over it, and Dutch engineers were then able to destroy the chain. While the docks were protected by the poorly supplied and hastily defended Elizabethan curtain fortress of Upner Castle, Dutch fire ships, ships filled with combustibles designed to be set alight and steered into enemy ships to set them on fire, managed to strike and burn the Royal James and the Royal Oak, two of the largest ships in the English Navy, as well as the second-rate ship of the line, Loyal London. All three were burned to the waterline. What was worse, the Royal Charles... I'm not even going to lie. Like, I play Age of Empires, and we got this exploding ships on there. I didn't know that was like a legit thing. I didn't know that they really built ships that they just rode into people and blew up. That ship must not have been as greatly adorned as the other ships or something. Like, it couldn't... Have, I can't see them just blowing up a normal everyday ship. Was it a ship built for that a specific reason? London. All three were burned to the waterline. What was worse, the Royal Charles, the flagship of the English Navy, which had been the ship that had destroyed the Dutch flagship Eendracht at the Battle of Lowestoft, was captured, being defended only by a skeleton crew. And the Dutch sailed off with the pride of the English Navy as a prize. <laughs> with the river now defenseless, the English ordered another 16 ships upriver to be sunk to prevent capture. In all, 13 English ships of the line were destroyed or captured. 30 ships were deliberately sunk by the English. They sunk 30 of their own fleet. Can you imagine how much time that would have taken them to replace 30 ships? In comparison, the Dutch fleet lost 8 fire ships expended and some Okay, Marines he said killed. fire ships, so they got to be built for that Samuel purpose. Samuel Pepys, a secretary of the Royal Navy Board, whose diary provides an account of the raid from the English point of view, wrote, Thus in all things, in wisdom, courage, force, Knowledge of our own streams and success, the Dutch have the best of us, and do end the war with victory on their side. The Medway Raid of 1667 is considered one of the greatest defeats of the English military in history, and perhaps the worst ever in English waters. And a lot of it was at their own hand, was from their own hands. 
The Dutch tried raiding some more up the coast, and they were largely repelled, but it didn't make much difference. The Medway raid had so embarrassed Charles II. The, the, the interdiction in trade had caused prices in London to soar, and there was a panic throughout the country that the Dutch and the French were going to join together and invade England. Poet Rudyard Kipling summed up the British performance at the battle at Chatham in a poem written some 250 years after the battle. If wars were won by feasting, or victory by song, or safety found in sleeping sound, how England would be strong. England was on the verge of rebellion, and Charles was forced to negotiate an unfavorable peace, which was concluded with the Treaty of Breda in July 1667. Among other concessions, the Navigation Acts were amended to allow Dutch ships to carry English cargo. The Royal Charles had a draft too deep for the Dutch coast, and so was permanently docked and turned into a sort of tourist attraction for European royalty, much to the embarrassment of Charles II. Oh, I'm sure. Because of Charles's objections, the ship was finally sold for scrap in 1673. Her stern piece, bearing the English coat of arms, is on display at the Dutch National Museum in Amsterdam. Charles II considered the raid to be treacherous, and he was incensed that the Dutch would attack while peace negotiations were going on. He, of course, uh, forgot about his own duplicity in those talks. Largely because of Charles II's bruised ego, the peace didn't last, and less than five years later, there was a third Anglo-Dutch War. The Second Anglo-Dutch War had large implications for the empires of these two major powers, but one of the implications is particularly interesting. Early in the conflict, the English had captured the Dutch colony of New Netherland in North America while the Dutch had seized English sugar colonies in Suriname. Largely able to dictate terms of the treaty, the Dutch chose to keep the colony in Suriname, which they saw as having more economic value. The British kept New Netherland, and the colonization of North America from then on would have a largely English character. The colony of New Netherland included a port, which the Dutch had built in 1648, and which had originally been called New Amsterdam. Because of the terms of the end of the Second Anglo-Dutch War, that port, New Amsterdam, fell into English hands, and it was renamed. Today, that port is known as New York City. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Make History New York Doctor. City Dutch Doctor. again. Between 10 and 15 minutes long, and if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe. There you go. Make sure you know we're already subscribed. up. Go subscribe to The History Guy. History deserves to be remembered. Yes, it does. And he is definitely... One of those people that keeps you entertained and intrigued and wanting to know what's coming next. So shout out to history guy to the history guy. Go show him some love. Hit the like button if you liked it. The dislike button if you disliked it. Check out one of the other videos up there. Subscribe right here if you want to see more content. Possibly your content. Until the next one, highly combustible. You guys be happy, healthy, safe. I love you to the moon and back. Peace.